Tried Regional Council. Um, really appreciate you joining us uh, for Learn, Build, Eat. Uh, really a celebration of local food in the North Carolina Triad um, and the formal rollout for what's been a big project for our food council, the Piedmont Triad Regional Food Assessment. Uh, my first order of business this morning, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank a couple of folks. First is the Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation. Um, these folks have been behind us the whole way with our food council and our regional work. Um, they're committed to equi equitable local food systems for healthy living, um, and they put their money where their mouth is. Uh, they're the ones who've made this assessment uh, possible for us and the other work we're doing uh, with our food council. Uh, and then also Carolina Creative Works. I will tell you that uh, Carolina Creative Works was chosen from a group of national consulting firms to do this work. Um, they've led us through, I think, a tremendous effort. I think you'll see the work. Uh, they, it's um, very foundational to what we hope to do in the triad. We hired them and then within a few well, months- I'm gonna let you go, Van, and we'll just be in touch. And I'll keep you posted. And if you have any questions, just let me know. <laughs> Sorry, we'll get somebody muted here. Please remember to mute if you uh, uh, are on the call. Uh, but yes, yeah, so the pandemic hit immediately after we hired these folks. Uh, they kept their nose to the grindstone, I think, uh, produced some great work for us. So um, just wanted to thank Carolina Creative Works for all the um, efforts they made for us. Going to the next slide. Um, for all of you on the um, in the meeting today, we do have the entire report available at the PTRC website, and then we also have this really great interactive online uh, report. And uh, both of the links for these will be put into the chat for you, and we'll forward them to you um, after the meeting. Um, this interactive tool we think is awesome because one, it summarizes what's a pretty hefty report. Um, it guides you through the metrics. They're great videos to help talk about some of the, uh, the issues we have within the region. Uh, it also has um, a lot of searchable interactive maps and tools within it so you can get down to very granular information uh, within the region and for particular areas you may have interest in or live in. Um, and then it also has a profile with metrics for each county uh, in the North Carolina Triad. Uh, and so we hope it's going to be a great tool, a kind of a go-to tool for, for our partners and our friends who are making positive impacts in the food systems within the region. So we'll send you those links and, and hope that you have a chance just to dig through those tools a little bit. Now I'm pleased to introduce Jennifer Bedrosian to you. Uh, we're so fortunate to have her on staff here at PTRC. She's our food system planner. Um, really has led this entire effort for us and, and all of our efforts in working with our food council. And she's gonna introduce the highlights of the assessment and, um, and introduce our speakers for the individual parts of the assessment today. So Jennifer, go ahead. Thank you, Matthew. Good morning, everyone. Um, the research from the regional food system assessment is organized into the five buckets you see here. Uh, Piedmont Triad Regional Food Council members were invaluable in guiding the food system assessment creating equity principles and research goals, and providing input on the design and execution of the project from start to finish. So next, Food Council members are going to be presenting key points from the research. So our first, um, our first research bucket this morning is food security, and it is presented by Food Council member speakers, Rachel Zimmer, Nikki McCormick, and Connor Miller. We have one um, quick update to Connor's slide. She is um, in a new role now as local food distribution coordinator at Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. So just wanted to make that quick update and I will turn it over to Rachel. Good morning, everybody. So for purposes of this food assessment, food insecurity was defined as the state of being when one does not have reliable access to sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious food at the household level. And this is important to know because it helps us measure food insecurity. Um, when you look at food insecurity over time, there was an increase in food insecurity in the United States between 2007 and 2008, which um, was, of course, during the recession. And then again, it is starting to peak. So there was some um, 
downturn of food insecurity rates after 2008, and now we're starting to see another peak due to the pandemic. So locally, food insecurity rates are actually projected to increase by one and a half to three times in 2001 or 2021. And food insecurity rates for children are actually um, even higher between 28 and 34 percent in 2020. Uh, one in three North Carolinians experience food insecurity. And, um, you know, food insecurity is tied pretty closely to poverty. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a graph that shows you poverty rates um, and food insecurity rates. And I'm going to turn it over to Nikki McCormick, who's going to highlight why this food assessment is so unique. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I, I just want to talk to you briefly um, about why this data is different uh, and, and where it came from. So this uh, data was made possible um, by a partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank um, and our partnership with uh, Link to Feed, which is a client level data um, software system uh, that allows us to get some, uh, as, as Matthew alluded to earlier, some more granular uh, level data than we've ever had access to in the past. So some of those uh, down to zip code level, um, you're looking at gender and um, uh, health status. And as you can see on your screen, um, race and ethnicity um, as identified by the folks who are seeking food assistance from the food bank's partner network uh, um, in the region. So you can see there on the left, uh, the folks who identify as black and African-American by zip code. And then on the right, those who identify as Hispanic uh, or Latinx by zip code. And there's all kinds of things, really cool programming that we can target as a result of this kind of data. But I'm gonna pass it over to Kana to talk a little bit more in depth about the kind of impact we might be able to have. Thanks, Nikki. So with this data, we predict that we'll be able to build stronger efforts to influence state and federal policy changes that address food security. We can see um, increased collaboration across various sectors, including infrastructure and planning. Next slide, please. Um, and so after this launch, we welcome future conversations about our findings and ways to build on existing data by offering partner presentations with an emphasis on county, the county level data. The council can build new and existing partnerships with agencies and organizations. This past year, we've seen successful innovations across the triad region to address food insecurity in Winston-Salem, the Food RX program, which we'll learn more about later in this program, um, and similarly, the Food Bank's Farm Fresh program. Both of these programs utilize collaborations across multiple sectors, including local farmers and agriculture, food, the food bank, and healthcare. So thank you so much, and I'm gonna pass it back to Jennifer. The next research bucket that we'll be talking about today is community assets and network analysis. And this will be presented by Food Council member speakers, Michael Banner and Tynese Holman-Payne. Greatest of morning, grand rising. Uh, I just wanna speak with you quickly about, you know, basically what is this for? You know, in this section, the research team mapped out community assets regional networks, supply chains, and other features of the food system gathered through community engagement, um, interviews, focus groups, and meetings. Uh, with this map, you will see the food councils um, and they identified the community groups, local nonprofits, and advocates who can help build this network of individual farms and champions in their counties. Now you won't see every individual group because for of course we have to respect their privacy, um, but you can contact PTRC for uh, further information about the individual groups that are in this map. Um, this data will allow us to appreciate the efforts of dedicated community members, as well as identify the work that needs to be done to sustain our food system. We welcome additions to this network. And um, I think Tynese will add on, you know, from what, yeah. what did we learn? 
Greetings and grand rising to everyone. So yeah, what did we learn about this? We basically learned that the representation is not equal uh, across all the regions. And we're seeing that 80% of the advocates um, and groups are concentrated in Forsyth and Guilford County, although most provide services in other counties. So few rural counties are involved on a leadership level in any of the agencies that provide services across the region. So our food councils are not represented in each county, which we would definitely like to change. And we're fostering active food councils in our country. And the county of the Piedmont Triad is a larger goal of the regional council. So why is this important? We need to know that this self-advocacy by those count counties helps them to become accountable uh, for the agencies that they're representing. So that takes us to our next slide, which is about us with a call to arms. So I will let you guys talk about that a little bit. And Michael and I, we want to talk together a little bit about this, about increased local partnerships. Uh, we want to have planning, transportation planners, economic developers, um, and we're going to be creating local food councils. So we encourage you to join the regional food council today. You can do so by going ahead and sending an email to Jennifer and that email address is right there at the bottom. We'll make sure we send that out to you guys also. And we will continue to build. So if anyone is on this call and if you see anything that's missing, please go ahead and just send Jennifer an email so that we can get that updated for you. And there are opportunities to join the PTRFC in a county that is not currently represented. So just go ahead and go to our website so that you can apply. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. So the next research bucket that we'll be discussing is food and farm production. And our food council member speakers are Tom Hensley, Emma Hendel, and Stesha Warren. Good morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day in Randolph County and I uh, at the farm. In the food and farm production area, we uh, looked at the USDA survey as part of the basis that's done every five years. So the last survey was conducted in 2017. Combined, there are more than a million acres of farmland engaged in various types of agricultural practices. The counties with the largest acreage in the practice in production are Surrey, Randolph, and Rockingham. Product sales are tracked into three categories. Animal products, so next slide, yeah. Animal products, crop products, and commodity products. The shorthand description of each area yeah. Animal products are in all forms of livestock. Crop products are the edible crops, including greenhouse and nursery operations. And commodity products are basically the non-edible crops. And our notable items in food production, the next slide, please. Uh, this section includes a uh, discussion of some of the impact of COVID in pro processing. Uh, the, the livestock area pointed out a real problem in our processing section, a real bottleneck that impacted the grocery stores all across. The other interesting is, or other interesting points are that uh, the a majority of the farms are small farms who make less than 100,000 a year, but all those add up and the importance of those farms has to be noted. And then also to talk about is a large number, a 60% drop in the number of farms in Randolph and Surrey since 2012 to 2017. And that pretty much raises the question, the follow-up is, who's doing all of this farming? And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to Emma. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, so if we take a look at the available data in the Piedmont, there's a pretty even split of people that are identifying as white versus a per versus people of color. And there's also a similar split among the male female population. Um, however, according to the latest available data from the agricultural survey conducted by the USDA, almost 90%, 97% of principal farm operators identify as white and the majority of those operators are male. And so it's just not reflective of the population in this region. And so to share more about the implications of this data, I'm gonna turn it over to Stesha. 
Awesome, Anton. Um, as you can clearly see, the data presented here is incredibly concerning uh, for our region with a lack of diversity amongst farmers. Um, with a lack of diversity amongst farmers, an alarming loss of farmland, and increased hardships on small farms, especially livestock farmers. But what can we do about this? Livestock farms are a large portion of our region's farms. There is a critical point when livestock needs to go to processing before it is no longer an economically viable option to the farmer. With farmers having to wait over a year to get into a process, processor, this can cause additional farm loss and business closings. This not only affects the farmers and their families, but it also affects the county and increases issues with food insecurity. We need more meat processing facilities as soon as possible. Uh, we also need to offer measures of protection and incentives to keep farms alive and operating. To help protect the loss of farms, programs like the Volunteer Agricultural Districts should be encouraged in addition to educating farmers on options outside of selling their farms. We need to find innovative ways to address the lack of diversity, both with gender and race, that can help preserve farms and increase land ownership and availability. I encourage you all to review your county profiles and contact your local food council representatives to discuss potential options for your area. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We will next be discussing supply chains and our speaker, here is Food Council member Jason Campworth. Hey everyone, I'm Jason Campworth. I'm with Foster Cavernous. Foster Cavernous is a wholesale produce distributor that covers uh, all of North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, we sell produce to everyone from major restaurants to hospitals to schools to the military groups. Um, so supply chain is our specialty at Foster Cavernous. Um, the study that we commissioned found that 67% of the food consumed in the triad is imported from outside of the region. Um, that statistic actually coincides with the 70% of produce that we sell as a company is actually some form of value added produce. Um, that is product that has been taken and adulterated from its whole natural form in some form or fashion and then sold to a consumer. Um, the value added has grown over the past decade. Um, people want things that are ready to eat. Um, an opportunity for supply chain to keep that percentage down in the amount that we need to import into our region would be to bring in value added uh, ability into the region. That also speaks to supply chain leakage um, and an opportunity for innovation in the region. Um, I know specifically that there are opportunities that have been taken in South Carolina. Um, there is going to be a 1.2 million square foot facility that is uh, partnered and spearheaded by Mass Genardi, um, and that's coming to South Carolina. That's something that North Carolina and our Piedmont Triad region could specifically capitalize on. Um, a lot of the local farms that Foster Cavernous has supported throughout the years um, miss out on opportunities to keep their products within this region because that value added product has to leave the region to be processed and then brought back into the region for consumption. Um, investment in infrastructure in both the pro processing infrastructure and cold storage infrastructure um, is a huge point of opportunity for the region. Um, my personal feelings are that should we bring a major processing facility to the region, uh, we would be able to almost stop all of the leakage uh, of produce that's leaving the region. The slide change, is that it? I'm on time. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, thank, thank you. All right, our next research bucket is market analysis and economic assessment. And that will be presented today by Food Council member speakers, David Allen and Zulfia Tersanova. So here's what we know. There are seven selected industries related to the food and food supply chains that bring in over $28 billion in annual sales to the region, generated by more than 6,400 businesses of all sizes. Markets and wholesale businesses account for the majority of the total sales for the Piedmont. Large processors and packers, along with large grocery and food retail chains, 
account for nearly 60% of the economic impact from these segments, highlighting the need for small and mid-scale farm and food businesses. On the next slide, we see three issues that were of significance. Pre-pandemic, we already knew there was a significant gap in the intermediary markets in the triad that helped small producers scale into larger markets, including wholesale. On one of the spectrum, we have robust farmers markets and on-farm sales opportunities with large wholesale and institutional opportunities on the other end of the scale. These are two very different markets. The issue is what happens to farmers who outgrow local markets but may not have the ability or resources to enter these large con wholesale contracts. Also, restaurants were particularly hard hit during the pandemic. Many restaurants closed and it's estimated that as many as one in three may close as a result of the pandemic. There are also equi equity concerns as restaurants close mm -hmm. as they employ large numbers of female workers and workers of color. Lastly, the biggest challenge uh, the region faces is lack of coal storage facilities for perishable agricultural products. It's important to note that these facilities be rated for ag use as opposed to medical or other uses. So that's what we know. Zofia is now going to tell us what we can do. Thank you, David. Uh, these are three recommendations. First is the coordinated support to address gaps in intermediary market, support for smaller farms and food producers between the regional and local economic development agencies. For example, farmers might band together to tap into the middle market with food cooperatives or food hubs. Uh, second is institutional purchasing with a focus on supporting local business and agricultural products. The triad has over 1700 institutions that can participate in the NC 10% campaign and commit to spend at least 10% of their food dollars on NC grown produce. Participation from these institutions would have a significant impact on the local food system. And third recommendation, invest in infrastructure. Aside from investing in cold storage, the triad needs to invest in reliable internet infrastructure, as well as additional education, digital literacy, and business training support for farmers. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our food council members for that presentation. Um, during our food assessment, issues surrounding equity in the food system were identified as a key priority for this project. Um, equity is just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. This was the definition that was adopted by the full council as a guiding definition for this project. And there were many challenges um, in outreach over the last year due to COVID-19. Uh, especially in communities identified as furthest from justice. You can read much more of detailed information about the challenges, creative engagement strategies that were used, as well as recommendations for building equity in the full assessment. Um, our Food Council acknowledges that this is ongoing work and the Regional Food Council is committed to building equity by engaging communities and building relationships. As part of this commitment, I'd like to introduce two notable women in the triad that are doing research and working with issues of equity, and that is Karen Terrell Jackson and Kathleen Liang. I'll turn it over to you, ladies. Thank you, Jennifer. So good morning, everyone. I'm glad to bring you greetings this morning from Greensboro. I work at A&T, North Carolina A&T State University, where I'm an assistant professor for leadership studies and adult education, and I teach research methods and policy courses. Jennifer and Victoria asked me to share a bit of inspiration, so I'll share a bit of what inspires me to, to the work that I'm doing in this space and a little bit of the research and evaluation that work that I'm doing here. So in 2013, um, Leah Penniman uh, negotiated um, a deal with the Albany County District Attorney's Office. I'm gonna tell you a little story. Um, this, what, the deal that she negotiated allowed youth to abbreviate their juvenile detention sentences and to earn food for their families by logging food time at her farm called Soulfire Soul Farm. Um, she, th this to me is a model of what communities can do um, to help break down structural inequities. Um, I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, some work that I'm doing with the leadership and research collaborative team. It's a collaborative between UNC Greensboro 
um, and Cone Health and North Carolina a and and other community partners. It's called Lifetime Eating and Physical Activity Practices or LEAP. And what LEAP believes is that local data allow us to make more informed, informed decisions and that those decisions should be made using community voice. Um, I also believe that as we use data and include the community voice that we can build more sustainable regional food systems. And I think some of the data that's already been shared today um, also demonstrate that. Um, but we also know that we have other equity gaps that we need to close. There's a study, a 2020 study done by Citigroup found that closing racial gaps in wages, housing credit, lending opportunities, and access to higher education could amount to an additional $5 trillion in the GDP and 6 million jobs in the American economy over the next five years. So we know that wealth building through entrepreneurship is one strategy that can address racial inequities. Um, in order to rebalance ownership in our food system, entrepreneurs of color need more capital. But those barriers to receiving that capital would need to be removed. So I'm going to provide this example here for to demonstrate what I mean. This data from a local CDFI shows that the majority of people uh, receiving the PPP funds uh, for food businesses were minority small businesses. You see that, that a, a large percentage of them were Hispanic and Black. That sounds great, right? But if you look further, we found that the largest dollar amount of those loans, was, which was over 10 million, went to white own small food businesses. This snapshot of small businesses is, in our local context leads us to ask more questions. We know that the capital gaps exist and what is described as the racial wealth gap endemic also contributes to the fact that while a business may have been in existence for many decades, their cash reserves, the amount of collateral and the credit worthiness still may not be up to a level that a financial institution finds debt ready or loan ready. The Center for Responsible Lending research shows that the administration of the PPP program, the application process, and the fee structure made it extremely difficult for small businesses, and particularly businesses owned by people of color, to qualify and receive assistance um, in time to save their businesses and the jobs of the employees that depended on them. So in closing, I just want to say that I believe that in order to transform the food system and to make it more equitable, we must close racial wealth gaps and to know if we are moving the needle or on those racial wealth gaps, we must use both qualitative and quantitative data in the appropriate context to inform our local and regional decisions um, as it relates to building our regional food system. I pass it on to Kathleen. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, I am from North Carolina a and and then uh, I'm also the director for Center for Environmental Farming System at a and uh, Center for Environmental Farming System is a three-way partnership between a and NC State, and the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and the Consumer Services. Now, following everybody's comments that we heard so far, especially Karen's information, I want to share some perspective about the uh, systematic inequality and also the uh, systematic kind of issues through racism and the other perspectives that we all recognize and acknowledge, especially in the last few months, a few weeks, uh, what occurred to all of us. Now, um, the equitable food system needs to build on four aspects, the accountability, the accessibility of food, and people need to be able to get to where they need, but also with a balanced nutrition, the value, and also we have to work with the farmers that make sure a balance and a choice is available for people to purchase with affordable cost. Um, many of the food um, may have a little bit higher price for people who are not able to afford a particular type of a produce or value-added product. But uh, more importantly, lately, we talk about the accountability issue is from the food safety and also the nutrition and health from the long-term perspective. So to do this work, it takes a lot of people together I'm so happy that you're all here uh, working together 
because this is a long-term perspective. It's we can't solve the problem overnight, but if we, if we all work together, there's great possibilities. And I'm gonna share some examples with you about what have happened uh, lately, especially because of COVID. We just heard about the COVID created the supply chain issues. So many farmers, local farmers or regional food hubs have worked with uh, local restaurants to transition the restaurant operation into healthy food aspects. Uh, they're not only selling food, they're also selling the ingredients, the fresh produce to families and the, even to teach them how to prepare healthy food. So very, very quickly, these shorter supply chain formed around the country to help all type of businesses to get out of a stress level caused by COVID, but being able to transition into a very quick and a very uh, flexible form of uh, communication and the connection among their community. Uh, I'm currently on the farm, so I don't have good video Wi-Fi to share with you, but uh, um, at a small farm unit in Goldsboro, that's where I am right now, Goldsboro, North Carolina, we help farmers to grow specialty vegetables that carry special medicinal purpose to combat chronic disease. So instead of just uh, uh, eating the vegetables, we also help people to understand the medicine and the nutrition compound that will help people to improve their health perspective. And beyond that, we connect with a local hospital to promote the, the program. So to link farmers directly to the family who are usually not able to access such information or such value in their produce. These are just a short examples. More information is available from the center uh, for Environmental Farming System website. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen and Kathleen. That was informative and inspiring. Um, for this next part, um, I wanted to let you all know that upon completion of the Regional Food System Assessment, our Regional Council voted on and prioritized these three action items that they want to focus on over the next year in order to be impactful in increasing equity, building relationships, and engaging those furthest from justice throughout the region. So the, these are the three action items that we will be working on over the next year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the first is Council to Community Listening Sessions. And the second is partner presentations that we'll be scheduling with different groups. And thirdly is um, our micro grants that we'll be offering through some shared gifting events this summer. They'll be called Listen, Build, Eat. And we will begin by offering those to four counties in the triad, um, and then which are Alamance, Caswell, Davidson, and Forsyth. And then over the next 12 to 18 month, months, we will open that opportunity and make that available to the remaining counties in the region. Thank you. So, so obviously there's a ton of information in this report. Um, I appreciate the fact that um, it will generate a lot of conversation because of how much we're trying to get out today. We didn't really set this up to be a question and answer session, but I love seeing the chat room very active. I encourage you that if you have questions to post them in the chat and I think food council members or staff will do the best to be responsive today, if not today, to get back to you on that. But uh, again, thank you for posting in chat and, and keep up the good work on that. Um, I guess one of the great uh, impacts of living in a region with vibrant agriculture and vibrant ag agricultural resources is the opportunity to eat incredible food. Um, and to add some flavor to our presentation today, I'm excited that we could do a chef demo. Um, Chef de Cuisine, uh, Michael Harkrader, and sous chef Jonathan Ramos uh, from Undercurrent Restaurant in Greensboro um, have a, uh, a, a neat representation of um, farm to table around a uh, Harmony Ridge Farms porterhouse for us today, pork porterhouse. And so uh, this is a little picture of how local foods can, uh, can turn into great food for you here in the region. I'm Michael Harkrader, Executive Chef of Undercurrent Restaurant. 
Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm Jonathan Ramos, executive sous chef at Undercover Restaurant. Uh, today I made a Harmony Ridge grilled pork chop with roasted sweet potatoes and collards, andouille uh, sausage, cream sauce, and a apple uh, radish and pea shoe salad. A lot of the product that you see on our table today is from, um, or distributed through Harmony Ridge Farms um, in Tobaccoville, North Carolina. Um, they raise the pork, um, they have the sausage made, um, they grow the radish and sweet potatoes and collards, but they also source the apples and radish sometimes and different vegetables like carrots from other farms throughout North Carolina and South Carolina. Um, and Isaac over there does a really great job of really pulling together agricultural from the region. Um, and that's not typical of a lot of um, farmers. They, they don't have the opportunity to do, do that, but they do that well. With the Andouille sausage cream, uh, is basically you have uh, celery, onions, um, Andouille sausage. You cook that down, and then you finish it up with the cream and let it simmer and uh, season it with salt and pepper. The sweet potatoes and the colors, the sweet potatoes, peel them off, right? season them with salt and pepper, all of them, put them in the oven and roast them. Then um, the colors, you just slice them up fresh and then uh, you'll put that in the pan with the sweet potatoes and saute until it's all wilted and cooked. Probably like about two to three minutes the most. Local just tastes better, at, period. That's, all, that's really all you have to say. Um, it's fresh, um, it's grown with love, um, and hands down, when a chef gets their hand on a local ingredient, they probably have a better chance of messing that ingredient up by working with it too much and keeping it simple and just putting it on the plate um, at its peak, um, how it was supposed to be tasted. Um, so that's why we tend to not try to do too many things that are way outside the box or really manipulating um, the ingredients. You know, the sweet potatoes were just roasted, lightly seasoned, the collards were kept fresh instead of really cooked down. Um, and you have that wonderful salad on top that's just very lightly minimally dressed. For the grilled pork chop, uh, we season it with salt and pepper and uh, lusty mustard, which is from Asheville, North Carolina. And then we put some oil on it, throw it on the grill finish it on both sides, usually around like about five minutes per side. And then you can either like let it rest or if, if you're gonna use it for a little longer, just put it in the oven and finish it up there. During the last three months of our menus and planning in general, we're still relying on a lot of the winter crops uh, to highlight seasonal local produce uh, because it's, it's winter time. The salad is pretty fresh, pretty crispy. You have the Arkansas apples with uh, the watermelon radish, radish and uh, the pea shoots. Uh, I made a simple like apple cider oil kind of vine uh, vinaigrette but that just includes salt, pepper, a little bit of sugar and whisk it together. And then I mix the salads together and that be, that's just the flavor. But the watermelon radish, this is the one here, it has, it's, it's awesome because the name watermelon is kind of similar to like a watermelon fruit, but it's not sweet. It still has a little bit of spiciness to it, but it's beautiful. The colors are really, like really bright pink, so it's pretty cool. At Undercurrent, we look to work with about a half dozen or so farms. Um, the past year has really made us limit our menu, so we really weren't able to branch out as much as possible. Um, but we have a handful of farms that over the course of the last 10, 15 years we've developed really strong relationships with um, and we try to support those. Um, but above and beyond that, uh, it really depends on the season, what a farmer can offer um, that dictates how much we can, we can order. We're definitely in the season where spring is coming, uh, but it's not quite here yet. Um, so your pea shoots are coming in, your radishes, really enjoy the late cool weather. Um, greens like collards and kale are available now. One thing I like about the triad uh, and the farms around here is that um, the weather is, is so changing. It's always raining, it's always hot, it's cold. So it's 
and then you have the guests also that are more like getting educated about food and about like produce and they always ask questions where is this from where is the source because they also kind of in a way care about the environment as well so i think that that's one of the things i enjoy as a as a cooking here is that i can get things that i know exactly where they're coming from you see the people when they come in and, and deliver it to you and you talk to them you kind of build a relationship through the years and it's just nice to know that oh I'm eating this apple but it's something that I can see while I'm driving around town there's a farm and the apple is there like it's kind of like a good feeling to know that that was and who is like putting it in the ground so for me I think that's one of the best feelings I get from it. I think the Piedmont offers anybody in the region just a bit of everything. You've got peaches to the south, apples in the mountain area. Um, the extra warm summers. I can't wait to taste that first strawberry, which is just a few weeks away. Um, so you get a little bit of everything, just like Jonathan said, uh, but it's also grown relatively close within an hour and a half um, from fall, winter, spring, and summer. Everything is right there. Come, Come visit, visit us at Undercurrent and try, try our spring menu. menu. Wow, so beautiful, fresh, uh, healthy, local foods from uh, Undercurrent. We appreciate them uh, um, putting together that demo for us. And you're going to be getting a, a recipe card when we send out the information after the meeting. But uh, great representation of what you can do here and also the seasonality that you see in a great area like the Triad and how the, you know, the best chefs and the folks who really take advantage of those seasons for different types of foods um, kind of bring the full breadth of what we can do here. Um, next, I think a real strength that we wanted to point out is uh, with our Regional Food Council. Um, they're just exciting things happening across our entire region. Um, and we can share those best practices and examples of what's going on in those. So uh, I'm going to introduce Corey Lindsay, who's one of our Food Council members, and she's going to talk about a big project going on up in Caswell County. So Corey, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll give you just a little bit of background on Caswell County. Um, we're in the Northern Piedmont kind of on the edge of the regional council. We have about 23,000 people in the county, um, but 90% of our population actually lives outside of our two incorporated towns. So we're very rural um, and we have only about 50% of our community members that have internet access. Um, so we're a primarily agricultural community. And um, I have been with the county for about five years doing economic development. Um, and when I started, there had not been anyone doing that work for about 10 years before that. Um, when we, when I started uh, five years ago, we went through a strategic planning process and um, we had really went through um, a community led input process that led us to develop some goal areas. Um, one of the key goal areas was that we really wanted to show support for our local entrepreneurs and small businesses. And of course, in Caswell, that also meant our agricultural producers and our agriculture based um, businesses. Um, the two strategies that we developed were um, we wanted to use a mixed use incubator space and also to develop an agriculture related enterprise center. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mixed use incubator space. And um, then Dr. Senegal will come in and talk about our efforts for an agriculture center. Um, as we explored an incubator space, we knew that we really wanted this to be a Caswell project. And so um, we were touring the area with a company that was looking at locating here, and they were an agricultural data company. And they had just finished uh, about with tech stars. And so as we were talking to them, we started developing this um, idea of creating a space where we could help support the entrepreneurial infrastructure of our community. Um, they are our anchor tenant in our new co working space. Um, and we um, developed the process with them and a lot of uh, research with community members. We then went ahead and tried to develop a budget um, with partners 
um, including touring facilities in other areas and taking pieces that fit well with our community. We knew that the priorities for Caswell would be the have to have equitable access to the facility. We wanted small businesses to be able to use the space and so we've kept our rates low um, and we decided that co-working was the best fit for our community um, we developed an affiliate relationship with raleigh founded which has co-working spaces throughout the state um, our economic development office moved to the facility to manage it uh, we've developed membership rates that range from 50 dollars um, to 150 and then um, more than that for a full suite for membership. We also did things like subscribe to a co-working management app. We developed policies and procedures, and we knew that at 60% capacity, we would be uh, revenue positive. Uh, we did open in December of 2020 um, and are gaining about two to three members a month um, and are excited about the future of this facility. We, um, excuse me. And so um, right now we currently have two suites leased and we um, uh, have many dedicated desk memberships um, and many of our area farmers have taken membership with the space. Um, the space is uh, 12, does have 12 suites. It has 24 seven access, which was key when you're trying to support the entrepreneurs in an area, they may have full-time employment other places. And we are seeing members utilize our facility quite a bit in the evenings. Um, and so, like I said, we are now open um, and we have the farmers utilizing the space. Um, let's go to the next slide and just show a few pictures of the space. And so as a food council member, as we dug into the, the profile a little bit more, we wanted to see how we could support our farmers as businesses. And this was one of the ways we could do that in Go Square um, because of the lack of internet access in the rural areas. But the other key was that we, when I went into the report, I saw that Caswell County actually had 15% um, farmer operators were African-American, um, which is very high compared to a lot of the other counties in our region. And so one of the things that we've done here is help support a, an African-American co-op that is forming in the area. Um, and I would like to, to talk about the other program um, that is that the other project that we're working on in Caswell County that I'm very excited about the seed project. Thanks, Corey. So if you'll go to the next slide, there it is. If you'll stay there for just a second. So in Caswell County for 20 years, they'd been talking about the need to have some sort of a center for agriculture folks to come together. And so what we realized after going to visit lots of those places, um, and using some data informed methods that Corey mentioned before is that we needed more than that. And what we found that we needed was something that we are calling SEED or the Center for Educational and Agricultural Development. Uh, thanks, Corey, that came to her in the middle of the night, um, but we love it. We think that's the perfect title for it. And the focus is not just on having an agricultural building, but to have an entire ecosystem that supports um, agriculture, um, improved um, health outcomes, and a better food system. And so really the, the focus of our of SEED is to educate, it's to incubate, and it's to build, right? So let's go to the next slide. And it talks a little bit about um, the idea here is that we have a food system that has a lot that SEED actually has a number of different components. So it's anchored by an educational building. So we were able to leverage some bond funds that we had along with some private funding. Um, and overall, we've been able to raise 5 million for the project. We're currently in the design phase. And so as we price out the other uh, components of the project, we will uh, raise the additional funds. Uh, the Small Business Center is part of our overall operations. 
but their connection is closer with the chamber and with the co-op space uh, that Corey mentioned before. But the college does serve as the fiduciary agent for the overall seed project. Um, so on this site, we'll also have an incubator farm, demonstration farms, um, but what we're also excited about is the partnership with a company called 4P and their food distribution uh, network. And they will also uh, co-locate space for our food banks in the area to have a space for refrigeration and storage and distribution. And then as part of the education building, we'll also partner with our health department to have space that not only operates as a clinic, but also as an educational facility. And so uh, you'll see on the picture there, it sort of describes what the 80 acre, uh, 78 acre uh, site looks like. What you don't see is that it's across from a visitor center. Um, it's got beautiful vistas. Um, it was previously used as tobacco land. And so we're going to be able to reclaim some of those spaces and actually encourage people to move into this area. Um, next slide. Okay, um, those, are, those, are, those are the things that we wanted to primarily share with you all um, about our project. We are um, proud that in a rural community, we've been able to come together um, and be creative about our funding uh, for this project and have it meet um, a number of different community needs while we're still um, pushing education for those who have chosen to focus on the agricultural field. So we are, we are just very proud of this project um, and we look forward to inviting you all to it um, as different elements of it um, are opened. And I believe my four minutes are up. <laughs> great stuff, thank you guys. You know, Caswell County is a great story. You guys are doing such great work up there and it has a very historically strong African-American farming community. Uh, it's very rural, and I think these answers to the, the, the ideas of incubation, uh, co-working spaces are uh, some of the real answers we need to find as we try to bring the next generation of farmers uh, into the fields uh, so that we can continue to have a robust farming economy in our region, so thanks for that. Um, we also had heard earlier that a, a key to a healthy food system is the processing infrastructure needed to add value to local agricultural products, and we heard some of that from Jason. Um, and we also want to present this best practice, which is Mitchell a meat processing, an example of a local processor. So if you all would enjoy this video. My name is Christy Mitchell, and I'm the owner of Mitchell's Meat Processing here in Walnut Cove. Um, we've also started this daughter company here, you could call it, as Mitchell's Butchery. And this is where we do all of our retail meat. I'm Carl Mitchell. I help her out the best I can uh, with uh, uh, operating the meat processing plant and all the logistics behind it. Um, being able to serve farmers uh, in our community. We, we serve a fairly large region. We have people coming from two and three hours away uh, to use our processing facility. So we're, we're a really limited group of people. Um, I would say, yeah. You know, the last check, there was like seven USDA plants that are doing custom processing for farmers uh, left from the state. Uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, a lot of the, the smaller plants just have not survived. Um, so that was a, a motivator for us. You know, we started off farming, um, raising livestock, and then we started selling meat in order to, to try and make our farm profitable. In March, when the big plants went down, there wasn't meat in the grocery stores. And people started realizing, not just us, but other meat processors, we have access to meats. We have access to get them meats. And that really triggered that local meats movement uh, to where that's where a lot of people go now. Um, our business has just bloomed and blossomed and, and, and it has done very, very well to the point where we did have to add this retail location. So everything we have here is either grown on our farm or other local farmers' farms, and then we purchase their meats to get that good local meat out to the, the customer. That is ultimately the mission of what we're doing, is to get good, healthy meats out to as many people as we can. We also love the fact that this is providing an opportunity for people who are not in agriculture to be able to build relationships with people in farming. 
The value of a successful farm can't be understated. You have the value of the animal uh, going through, going through, being born here, raised here, uh, processed here, and sold here. Uh, that's that's you know millions of dollars that are kept that are initiated in our area, and uh, that money is retained without being shipped out. Um, so so our impact is, is much bigger than just our business itself. We're basically a service uh, for our farmers, and that allows farmers to be successful. Uh, so you know when you come when it comes to thinking about what we actually do, why you want to be processing facility in your area is not just our business, it's our service that provides uh, opportunity for farms to be successful. Um, and again, the value of a farm is more than just the farm itself. Uh, it's what it does for the community, uh, it's what it does for the landscape, and it's uh, quite frankly what makes people want to move to our area. Great stuff, um, and I think that um, actually um, he was a um, uh, worked with I think Cooperative Extension before he went into business there, and so has been a great uh, member of our farm community for a long time. So it's a great story of processing, and one of the needs that came out of the study was uh, again this middle processing piece help our farmers uh, be more successful. The next one we have, you know, I think one thing that again showed up clearly in our in the work was uh, that we have a lot of farms. We do not have as many big industrial operations. We have thousands of smaller farms, uh, and, and and we have a lot of vibrant, innovative farmers finding new ways to survive and flourish um, in the environment that we have. And one of those uh, is co-owned by Emma Handel, who's one of our food council members, and she's telling you the story here: a fair, fair share farm in Poptown, North Carolina. So here's another good video for you. Hi, I'm Emma. I am one of the owners of Fair Share Farm located here in Poptown, North Carolina. Fair Share Farm is run by myself, Emma Hendel, and my husband, Elliot Seldner. We were established in the fall of 2014. And uh, today we serve retail customers, restaurant customers, and wholesale customers in Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and Charlotte. So at Fair Share Farm, we had, you know, the same shock of the pandemic that everybody experienced, but really it's been an opportunity this past year for Fair Share Farm. And it was just a huge opportunity to expand into the retail market. Previously, we've been really focused on um, our restaurant sales and wholesale accounts, and that used to account for about 70% of our business, while the retail aspect of the farm and our sales was only 30% of our business. Last year, that just completely switched. So now, like the, the pie looks the same, but it serves different customers. If you went into a store this time last year, you may have felt like, I don't see the fresh vegetables here. Like everybody has bought all of the vegetables from the grocery store. And a lot of people started calling their local farms and they were like, can I get vegetables from you? And it's like, yes, I've been here this whole time. I'm so glad you're calling me. How can I get these vegetables to you? So we started offering retail pickup at the farm. And so people would place their orders online, come to the farm and pick it up. We pack all those orders up and they'd be ready to go. And so a lot of people have actually, you know, jokingly said, oh, well, with Without COVID, I, I never would have become your customer. And I'd say we work with about 15 different farm businesses um, and they all just produce great things that everybody should be eating that come out from this local area. When the relationship is stronger because there's a viable business that um, that people are trying to promote and protect, like it, it, it intensifies the relationship between people um, and producers that are occupying a certain region. And, um, and I think now more than ever, people are aware and more open to the idea of, of eating seasonally and enjoying what they can get basically, you know, from their neighbors. And,
So Emma is an incredible positive force on our food council. I think you can see why when she can come up with positives about the pandemic, that's awesome. Uh, Emma, we appreciate all the great work you guys are doing. That's a great representation of, I think, the innovation we're seeing uh, with our farmers in the region. Um, we also talked about an important component of our economic structure around our food system is distribution. And you heard from Jason a little bit earlier, and now he's going to tell, tell you a little bit more about Foster Cabinets, which I think uh, was founded in 1902 as a small produce provider, and now I think it's serving um, four states. Uh, so uh, go ahead and roll this video. Cavanus has its roots in North Carolina dating back to 1902. We just really take a lot of pride in being able to be a food distribution partner for the families in our region. My name is Jason Campworth. I'm Independent Director and Special Projects Director at Foster Cabinets. We see many opportunities with farms within the region to aggregate products together. Uh, there's a lot of rural areas within the region and it makes it difficult for distributors like us to partner with those small farms if they're so spread out and they're not aggregating many products at their farms. Distributors like us uh, want to partner with those small farms, but if a farm only has a couple of different products to offer, it doesn't necessarily make it as advantageous for distributors to want to support that farms in certain areas and different communities can uh, band together and offer co-ops to where they can aggregate products from the several farms in that community and make it more advantageous for distributors to get a product from it. So the infrastructure that is needed to really further develop um, the region's agriculture uh, are things like cold storage and shared transportation. Uh, one approach that we've taken is even if we're not buying or selling a farm's product, uh, we've offered a service and using our trucks that are already out crossing all the highways in North Carolina um, to go and pick up at these farms and offer backhaul services to other distributors that uh, would not necessarily run their trucks in that area. So a farm in North Carolina can reach out to us through our website, we have a link on there, and they can say they want to become a farmer for Foster Cabinets. Uh, we get that information, and we reach out to the farm, and we walk them through the steps, and in many cases, those farmers have not had any type of food safety audit before, don't really understand the insurance regulations. We walk them through that, and we connect them with resources to help them uh, attain those audit certifications and insurance requirements so they can do business with companies like us that sell produce to the schools and to the government the hospitals, you know, that are subject to food safety regulations. Great, thanks, Jason. Um, our last program we're gonna highlight is a great one. Um, it's the Fresh Food Rx program. Uh, so the Wake Forest School of Medicine is working to to turn good local food into good health. Uh, and Rachel Zimmer, who chairs our food council, is going to tell you a little bit about that program. Hey, everybody. So watching all these videos, number one, made me hungry. And number two, made me appreciate um, all of the wonderful work that is happening around our uh, region. So thank you guys for all the work that you do. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just briefly talk a little bit about food insecurity and health. Um, next slide. So I um, am the director of the Wake Forest Baptist Health Mobile Health Clinic. And then I also run a food prescription program. Um, and that started in um, March of last year. But I want to highlight why in the world do I even consider that as an option. So one thing um, that research shows is that food insecurity and poor health outcomes are really closely tied together. So what you see are there different pathways for why food insecurity might cause chronic health conditions. Um, one pathway is diet or nutrition. And so what that means is that if you consume low cost or energy dense foods, um, uh, you end up having more chronic health conditions potentially, that's one theory. The second theory is that you add stress to uh, the pathway and you have higher cortisol levels and those higher cortisol levels can lead to uh, chronic health conditions as well. Um, next slide. 
And so the pathways from food insecurity to chronic health conditions is actually pretty complex. It's not just about diet. It's not just about stress. Um, and it does include healthcare behaviors. So in many cases, especially in uh, my older adult patients, I'll find that they will sacrifice their food for their medicines. And so when you have the interrelationship of these three things, um, you end up with chronic health conditions and um, decreased life mortality. Next slide. So as a healthcare provider, you say, well, okay, what in the world can I do about that? Um, so Dr. DeMarcus is a family medicine physician and she just recently did um, a systematic review looking at different types of food prescription programs across the country and found that um, there was some mixed evidence, but basically home delivered meals seem to have the strongest evidence for helping with uh, diabetes outcomes, healthcare costs, et cetera. So um, that leads us into my program. Um, so Fresh Food Rx is a program that I started actually uh, in collaboration with Dr. Kimberly Montez and several community partners. Next slide. Um, and what you're going to see here are the community partners in action. So we actually wanted to support local and urban farmers. And I approached Emma, uh, so this is actually her team, um, with Fair Share Farm, and she actually jumped to uh, helping right away. It was amazing. So what she does is she actually collaborates with the local and urban farmers to get produce and puts them in these beautiful boxes. And, um, and then I also, um, as you can see here, we had actually volunteers who started um, helping us at the beginning of this program, and they would actually deliver these every week. Um, and it was just amazing to watch that, but I really wanted to operationalize it. So we worked with Hope of Winston-Salem, New Communion. Um, those are both mobile uh, food pantry um, ministries in the community. Uh, we worked with Second Harvest Food Bank, Providence of Winston-Salem, uh, Fair Share Farm, and Love Out Loud, actually. And so we started um, delivering produce and prepackaged meals to older adults who identified as being food insecure in the community. And a lot of those were actually my patients. Um, I do primary care for older adults in their home. Um, and so it's kind of fun to take care of their health, but also um, to help them um, eat um, in many cases. So what we do now is we've been able to operationalize this to the point where we have a social worker, Sheena, oh, cute, right on action. She uh, coordinates um, with Larry, who you see here, and Sharon. So they're our drivers. Um, and she will call all of our participants now and see, hey, do you have the utensils that you need? Can you, can you make the produce that we're providing? Do you have a microwave? Uh, for example, yesterday I saw a patient who did not have a microwave, but she really wanted these prepackaged meals and we're gonna to work to get her a microwave so that she can warm them up. Um, but most of our patients, over 90% of them have some sort of functional or cognitive disability. And these are people who are unable to get into Meals on Wheels because of, you know, of course the waiting list. And we're finding that as a healthcare institution, we really need to do something to help uh, alleviate some of the food insecurity because we know it's directly tied to um, health conditions in our patient population. So, um, so right now we serve 130 older adults and we're hoping to um, expand this into food pantries because we do have younger people. We have families with children. Our patients in the mobile clinic, about 35% of them are telling us that they're food insecure or having trouble getting food. A lot of those people have children. Um, Dr. Montez, who I mentioned before, is a pediatrician, and we are just really hoping to expand this model into the community more. Um, so uh, we have a nutritionist who supports our program. Um, we do weekly newsletters. We now have a web page that just came on board last week, so I'm excited about that. Um, so the nutritionist and the YMCA health coaches, um, who's also a nutritionist, they will call our participants and help them you know, with health goals or help them kind of work through a recipe if they want that. Um, and we, I also do research attached to this. <laughs> I saw a question about my funding. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and um, this is, we, we actually also ask our patients, I do community informed programs and community informed research. 
So we ask our participants, what is impactful about this program? What could we do differently? And we actually provide that feedback in real time to our partners who can then put produce that people like. So I know Emma, you know, she had noticed that people were wanting collard greens. So she started putting collard greens in the box or people were asking for oranges. And, you know, we don't regionally source oranges usually in the winter, but she found a partner who could get oranges. So um, right now, <laughs> I, I call myself a grant writer. Um, I write a ton of grants to help support this program, but we actually have funding through June, as far as I know. Um, I have applied for a couple other grants. We were able to raise about $15,000 at the very beginning of this journey from the community. And we have a webpage on Love Out Loud where people can donate um, into the program. I donate into the program myself, actually. Um, and so, yeah, uh, funding takes a lot of uh, grant writing. So um, I think programs like this are difficult because they are somewhat innovative and most of the funding tends to be sourced from research or foundations. And there's so many competing priorities right now, it's hard to um, you know, find consistent funding for something like this. But I believe that it is something worth funding. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, uh, Rachel, and, and we're so fortunate to have the School of Medicine and Wake Forest Baptist Health, who I will tell you, they're very active in social determinants of health on a broad scale and food being such a key component to that. Uh, they're doing great work in that area. So I appreciate you presenting that. Um, I know that we're a couple minutes over. I do think we have a couple slides, one with our food council members and, and um, Oh, I may be jumping the gun. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so our food council members here, uh, one, I've got to tell you, they are tremendous volunteers. They're putting in great work. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work to put together and to support uh, the efforts that we're doing with this assessment and other things. And I just want to thank them personally. We do have uh, our goal of covering all 12 counties. I think we have a couple of gaps there. We're always looking for more membership. So if you're interested in that, uh, then certainly get in touch with us. Um, I do also need to, and I didn't mean to breeze through those slides, thank a couple of folks. Uh, first, um, there have been some great comments about the videos. Um, Willa Longbreak, who's a student at the UNC School of the Arts, uh, produced those and created those from scratch, did all the editing. So I want to thank her for her great work and those will be available on our website. We'll send out links to all of those. Uh, once again, I want to thank um, Chefs Jonathan Ramos uh, and Michael Harkrader from Undercurrent for um, their presentation to us. And I, if, if we're all hungry, go to downtown Greensboro and hit their restaurant, Undercurrent. I, I have to admit, I haven't been there and I will be going now. Um, that was a great meal they put together and you'll be getting a recipe card uh, from that presentation. Uh, also wanna thank the folks, uh, Fair Share Farms and Emma, um, the Food RX, the Mitchell's Produce, the Jason Foster Cabinets, all of you who gave of your time to allow us to video your operations and, and show a little bit about the great things that are happening in our region. All of our presenters um, who have given us good information today. Um, I, I, I really want to personally thank, I, I saw her come on later, we, we thanked Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation earlier. Uh, Mary Davis has joined us, I, I, I don't want to put her on the spot, but I do want to personally thank her. She has a great passion for this and she is the one who uh, quite frankly guides us through their processes and, and has a personal passion for I think health and, and um, local foods. We couldn't do this without her and, and I want to make sure that I personally thanked her uh, before we signed off today. Um, again, um, we have the contact information for you for Jennifer. Uh, we'd love for you to keep engaged with us. Um, this information is going to Again, the full report's online. The interactive report is online. We'll be sending you all the information from today. And the Food Council is going to keep chugging along. I think what we know from the work we've done so far and from this assessment, it's very clear. We've got great assets and local foods in this region. We have some great things going on. Um, we have gaps. And if we can figure out ways to address some of those gaps, um, the opportunities are limitless for us in building a strong economy around food that serves farmers and other businesses in the food industry uh, and building equity and, and justice into our food system so that we can have healthier, more unified communities in this region where folks have access to good foods that we produce here locally. So um, again, a thank you to all of the folks, all of our presenters, uh, Jennifer and uh, our staff for putting this together, Victoria Randria, who is our engagement specialist, 
Uh, and thank you all for your time and patience in, in allowing us to present today. Uh, and uh, I think with that, I'll sign off. Thanks, Matthew.